scientificimagination.org. And maybe an even better example would be Einstein's theory, which was written up 100 years ago, and he predicts that there should be black holes, and only last year we were able to snap a picture of one. Yeah, that shows that definitely having the imagination is a very, very useful tool for a physicist. In this second episode, I will be talking to Stach Kuipers, a PhD student at the Spectroscopy of Gold Molecules group of Professor Bas van der Meer Akker at the Radboud University, Nijmegen, the Netherlands. In his research, he studies the fundamental interaction between molecules by colliding them with one another. This study is part of the broader field of molecular physics, which lies somewhere between the physics and chemistry. As a molecular physicist, Stach is occupied by two things. First, he uses physics tools like lasers and electric fields to study molecules. And second, he uses these molecules as a test bed for interesting physics. In this interview, we will talk about the role of imagination in his work as a guide to new possibilities and discovery. Stach, thank you for being part of this project on scientific imagination. How are you, first of all? Yeah, I'm doing very well. I'm very lucky that uh, for me, the corona crisis doesn't have very large impact, so I can keep on doing my experiments in the lab. Yes. There are not too many people around. The experiment is fairly big. It's like a machine of three meters, so very easy to keep a distance from other people. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, please, could you introduce yourself? What is your background and your current occupation? Yeah, so you already gave a pretty good introduction. Uh, so I'm a PhD student at the Radboud here in Nijmegen, uh, and I started my studies also in Nijmegen. And basically in the same field as I'm in now, so at the intersection between chemistry and physics. For my master, actually, I kind of wanted to do something else uh, because I was interested in theoretical physics. So I made a swap there with a good recommendation of my, my professor at that time. And uh, well, in the end, it didn't really turn out to be so great because if you do theoretical physics, you are left alone with your imagination the entire time. And hmm. uh, well, that's not something that was very right for me. That, so I wanted to have this, this uh, balance between experimental work and theoretical work. And this is something that works really well for me and that I'm now back to. And I really love it. So what was your biggest motivation to follow this path throughout your study and career? There's sort of an elegance to the theoretical physics and uh, the complete mathematical description that I wanted to get better at. Actually, also see if I could do it. But yeah, it's really, really hard. But I, I really wanted to pursue that. And in the end, I ended up in an internship actually at sort of a computer science slash mathematics department. And this was really cool. The, ba the main drive for most of these decisions I took during my, during my career have been based on the interest I had at that point, which I think serves a researcher very well. I think so too. And now you're doing very interesting research. Could you elaborate on your, your current research? Yeah, definitely. So what we do is we collide molecules, right? You already mentioned this, and this might be very abstract to most people, but they, you might know that everything around us is made up of atoms, and some of these, they group together and they form molecules. The only reason the world around us is so exciting is because all of these molecules are all the time in motion. So, for example, water is made up of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom, and in water, they constantly bump into each other, and that's actually what makes it liquid. If they would have a, a stronger interaction, for example, like sugar, they make a solid and it doesn't flow anymore, but rather it breaks when you drop it. So, the way molecules molecules interact and basically the strength with which they hold on to each other. Yeah, that's what makes up our entire world. And the fact that they move, yeah, makes it such that there is interesting stuff to look at happening around us all the time. One thing we haven't talked about yet is that in some cases when molecules bump into each other, it's actually such that their bonds break, these atoms rearrange and we form completely new substances. So this is what would be a chemical reaction, right? So I just want to illustrate that everything happening around us is a, is a result of these molecules interacting, feeling each other, reacting with each other. And so what we try to do is we study this in an isolated way, as every experiment, right? Uh, you try to isolate the stuff you're, you're looking at. So what we do is we take a pair of molecules at a time, we put them in a vacuum so there's nothing else, and we make them collide and look at what's happening. Arguably, you lose some of the, of the, of the complexity, the large-scale complexity, but that's not what we're interested in. We want to see at the tiniest level what is going on between two such molecules when they are close and how they make up the dynamics all around us. Always mentioned almost in one breath with this kind of research are quantum computers. Could you explain what quantum computers are and what they are used for in your field of research? Yeah, so my field of research is actually very fundamental, right? And people always ask me, okay, but what are you going to do with this? And uh, will it 
ever actually be useful. And what's very exciting is that right now, yeah, we're kind of on the verge of, of starting to find a technological application for this molecular research. And especially because these molecules, uh, they exhibit such an extraordinary behavior, there is potential to, to actually use this for yeah, our technological uh, machines. Sort of the ultimate use case for quantum technology, that would be a quantum computer. And this, well, at this point, hypothetical machine has been envisioned already, let's say, halfway through the past to the last century. Actually, right now, people are making very good progress on making these. And despite its name, a quantum computer is not really a computer as you might know it because it operates completely differently because it's based on molecules or I should say based on quantum particles, right? And what people say is that once we have a quantum computer, there will be sort of three forms of computing. You will have your brain, a normal computer, both of which operate very differently. And then in the future, we will also have quantum computers, which again add a new sort of, yeah, completely new tool for us to use. And there are many proposed blueprints to realize such a device. And one of them basically based on trapped molecules like the ones I study. So actually what most current computers have a really hard time of is simulating what this quantum world will do, right? Uh, and one example would be, let's say, medicines. So quantum computers might be able to simulate medicines and also the way they interact with your body, better yet, some proteins in your body, and they might predict then which medicines will be effective and which will not. So that is one of the applications to basically using a quantum computer to simulate the quantum world and better predict how we could, could make molecules that will help us, like medicines. There are other applications which are maybe more abstract, but it will range from encryption, so the security of our communications, and also more mathematical infrastructural problems like the traveling salesman problem. So that will be the problem where you want to find the shortest route in between, let's say, a hundred cities. Is it about efficiency then also? Yes, very much. Yes. So current computers have a very hard time calculating these sorts of yeah, optimal outcomes. Yeah. And as a result, we sort of have approximations. But quantum computers could be able to do that in a much better, much better way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You wrote that the storage capability of these extremely delicate machines is often limited by the fact that occasionally release a particle from its storage. And if we could suppress this effect, that would be of major interest. However, in order to come up with these new theories, you need to imagine how you could achieve unlimited storage capabilities. Am I right? Yeah, exactly. And could you sketch how constructing these new hypotheses work in your field of research? Yes, definitely. First, maybe I want to tell a little bit more about how you could maybe think about such a quantum computer. You know, in the ancient days, they had like abacus, yeah. had these wooden beads that are on a frame. And as a human, you can manipulate them to store information and actually do very complicated calculations if you, if you know how to do it and these trapped molecule quantum computers they work kind of in the same way so we have molecules instead of wooden beads and they're suspended in a vacuum and what we can do with lasers and electric fields is manipulate them to store information and again do calculations the general concept is a bit the same in that we have some isolated system and we use that to store, store information now you can imagine that if some collision comes along and knocks one of your particles out of place yeah then the question is where was this wooden bead right where did this piece of information go so that's very hard then to correct so essentially indeed when you have a collision you lose information and also you, you yeah you get an error in your calculation and that is one of the main limitations in these quantum computers nowadays at least the ones that are based on trapped molecules and since i study collisions yeah this might be a good problem for us to tackle right and I have to be honest, uh, I'm not directly affiliated with, with research on quantum computers, but we do practice uh, the manipulation of these particles. So you asked how we can construct uh, new hypotheses mm -hmm. in our field of research. And uh, I basically want to distinguish between, let's say, the daily stuff and the long-term stuff. So in the long term, we want to understand what these molecules are doing. And actually, much of the theoretical work on this is being done by a completely separate group, theoreticians also here in Nijmegen. And they work full-time trying to predict and simulate what these molecules will be doing and how they will behave. And their result are then being used to compare against our measurements. So actually, in this case, hypotheses are formed uh, by communication between our group and theirs, and then mainly between the professors also. So Bas van der Meerakker and the theoretical side, uh, Gerrit Groenenboom and Ad van der Avoort. Yeah, they will have the most interesting discussions about, okay, what does this data actually mean? And often, often when they start to understand each other better, maybe when their imagination aligns, let's say, uh, <laughs> that is where interesting questions and conclusions will get formed. It takes two specialists basically to, to perform our experiments. So one, one specialist to perform our experiment and one more specialist to, to simulate what is happening. And they have to talk to each other. It's almost too much for one human to get into his head. And yeah, so here communication, I think is very, very important. 
it also sounds like an interdisciplinary process that you have to become better traders. You have these two experts in their fields and they have to trade data with each other, but also uh, make new definitions of uh, the words they use in their work field. Yes. So oftentimes, indeed, we might use a word as experimentalists and the theoreticians will have a, a different association with that word, let's say. But you have to, yeah, you do have to make the, 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 the estimate of which informa what information will be useful to my my collaborator yes uh, and then the second thing we're doing and that maybe relates more to the work that i'm doing is sort of the daily stuff uh, in doing such an experiment right in order to perform this experiment you have to understand what it is you're doing okay, okay you're measuring something but without knowing what it is this data doesn't mean anything right yeah <laughs> basically to construct new hypotheses there's a constant iteration between the experiment um whatever is in my head so you might call it imagination but also simulation so we have one one of these machines at the faculty in Nijmegen that approximates this entire machine and the computer. And on top of that, I try to maintain a copy in my mind, right? And every time one of these gives a different answer, yeah, that means something is not really well understood yet. And you have to pursue this in your research and try to make these models align. So you have this framework about theories in your head, your your background knowledge that you employ to interpret new data. Yeah. You refer to the Stark decelerator. Could you elaborate what a Stark decelerator is? Yeah, definitely. So again, we want to collide molecules. And if you want to do a nice experiment, then you want to make sure that it's repeatable, right? And in our case, actually, we do it 10 times a second. We do that by creating these molecules with electric fields. And this is exactly what the Stark decelerator does. So basically, it's a, a whole array of electrodes and the molecules fly in between those. We try and manipulate these molecules to basically do our bidding, right? Um, so that's what the Stark decelerator is doing for us. And basically it acts as a gun for molecules. And we use the Stark decelerator to really precisely steer the molecules and also time them such that we can measure them the same way every time. It's very hard to grasp the information that you are telling me when you're not an expert in this field. And there are a lot of images and also images on the visualization of data generated by the Stark Decelerator. How important is it to visualize? Yeah, so the Stark Decelerator is basically the first part of our experiment, it's the mm -hmm. preparation. And then the Stark Decelerator is aimed at our detection region, where we basically read out the results of our experiment. In the end, this is basically just snapping a picture of the collided molecules and specifically the, the direction they are flying. So you can imagine maybe if a molecule does not collide, much like a billiard ball does not collide and you miss your target, then you will just continue straight, right? So you will hit the backside of the billiard table every time. And basically all the particles end up in a single spot. But now if I do make a collision, my particle is scattered out of place. And I can see that with the camera because now the particle ends up in a different spot. And in that sense, I'm really lucky because we can actually make pictures in our, in our line of research. And we can actually see which direction the molecules scatter in. And the huge benefit of that is that because we have a picture, we also have a very rich representation of the data. Yeah, so to circle back to your question, uh, it's very important to both visualize your data, but also to visualize your methods. You were telling about this method, and I was wondering, could it be that you rely too much one method? Could this also be a pitfall? Yeah, very good. So you have to be critical, right? Mm. Uh, so that's an excellent question, actually. Yes, this is definitely a downside. Hopefully, sort of the way the community is set up, and this would be sort of an ideal scenario of a well-functioning scientific community, right? Every department is following only one method, but it should be that somewhere around the world, there will be another group having a slightly different approach, kind of asking the same question. And obviously, when you do not arrive at the same conclusion, only because you use a different method, yeah, then basically the conclusions that you infer about these molecules, they cannot be valid. So you have to take extreme care to make sure that the conclusions that you draw are sort of universal. Basically, the only way to do that, I think, is to try really hard to understand what it is you're doing. You were saying that these other groups are basically forming benchmarks to, to compare your, your output, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were also mentioning that these theoretical physics are very much based on only using imagination. There's this skeptical challenge that every single one of us have their own way of working through an imaginary scenario. So you can never come to justification. So is this a problem that imagination as employed in, in natural sciences has no benchmark? outside imagination itself it's a very philosophical question so no no it's very interesting and i really want to answer it yeah it's a good question again yeah so there will then be a difference between let's say thought experiments in science that will always stay thought experiments 
then there's a separate group in which theory sort of moves ahead of the experiment. Yes. So doing experiments takes a long time, especially if you look at, for example, CERN and Geneva, right? Where they do, they have the large particle collider. Yeah, to build such a thing, it might take 10 years or even half a decade, right? Yeah, in this case, it's a very good idea to start with your thought experiments before the experiment finishes, because you can move much faster in some cases. But then at some point, you need, again, theoretical validation to show that your models are actually correct. So I'm not sure about the years here, but somewhere before, let's say, 1980s or so, there were lots of theoreticians making amazing models on these particle physics that they are doing in CERN. And only somewhere in 2012 or so, they discovered, let's say, the Higgs boson that could then validate this model. Well, every time this happens, that the prediction is, let's say, 50 years in advance of a theoretical validation. Yeah, that's amazing. And that actually shows already that these thought experiments definitely do have value. And maybe an even better example would be Einstein's theory, which was written up 100 years ago. And he predicts that there should be black holes. And only last year, we were able to snap a picture of one. Yeah. That's crazy. But yeah, it's awesome. That, yeah, that shows that definitely having the imagination is a very, very useful tool for a physicist. Because you need to have imagination to, to sort of dream up. Yeah, you had a very nice quote in, your, uh, in the document you sent me. Let me look it up. Um, imagination might be regarded as attention to possibilities. Yeah, I really like that. Because that's exactly what it is. You, you, yeah, you want to think about everything that might be possible. And then by exploring these and kind of deciding which of these is the most plausible, or the most interesting, yeah, you can direct your research and try and validate one of these possibilities. Yeah, in that case, imagination is huge and essential also. Yes. Because you cannot always do experiments, try to explain what is going on, and then move on to the next experiment. Sometimes you need theory to move ahead and say to experimentalists, this is what you need to do and check that it's right. And maybe it's not, but that's then also, again, an interesting result. You were also talking about purely theoretical physics, and that's also a large class of models that are out there right now. So one that springs to mind immediately is like string theory. Basically embedded in the theory is already that we will never be able to measure it. Yeah, okay, you can have a model that explains sort of everything, but what worth is it or what value does it have if you can ever validate that it's true? We have to rely on employing these thought experiments and using imagination as the tool for verification. Yes, and actually one of the, the properties that physicists are after is sort of elegance. If you can describe the same phenomenon with a shorter formula, okay, that one must be better. <laughs> Right. Yeah. In that sense, maybe if you cannot really test the model, but it does include everything uh, in an elegant way. Yeah. Maybe that's enough. But oftentimes in these models, you have to, let's say, go to a new level of abstraction. And it's not really clear again to implement the, the rules of this model into the world that we are living in. So you get no predictive power, just mm. a new way to think about reality and maybe a possible way to think about reality. So I, I want to move to the to the next question I have for you, because my research is, is focused on the imagination in astrophysics. And there's a really overlap between different disciplines here. Could you explain to us how researching tiny, tiny molecules in a lab can help us understand and explore the vast universe? Yeah, so in my mind, there's sort of two ways of exploring the universe, right? One is to learn about the universe, and that is something we can actually do here on Earth, for example, with the, the particle collider at CERN. And then the other way is to, to go into space and see what is out there. And actually, in both cases, studying molecules is actually a good way to practice both of these. Yeah, so maybe it's time to head into space. And basically, as soon as you're into space, you also need to know where you're heading. And a big part of that is keeping track of where you are. If you think about how you do that here on Earth, yeah, you have to know where you are. Part of that is position, but you also need to know where you are in time. And the better you can track your time, uh, actually, the better you can navigate. And if you go out into space, you better have a really precise clock. Because if in the meantime, while you're traveling, the Earth is traveling around the sun. The sun is traveling around the center of the galaxy. So everything is in motion. And you need to have a good model to keep your navigation working well. Yeah, and then I promise this would lead back eventually to, to molecular physics. And actually, the best way that we have right now of measuring time is what what's called atomic clock. And then what is even a better property of molecules, maybe, is that all of them are the same. So if I have two molecules of the same substance, they will behave exactly the same. So if I give you a clock and myself a clock, yeah, yeah they can measure the time at exactly the same rate. Whereas if I have two watches, one will tick faster than the other, always. 
So that's a nice property of molecules. They are identical, so everybody can measure the time in an identical way, and they are extremely precise. So if I'm correct, we need these precision measurements in order to, to explore the, the infinite, so to speak. Yes, and actually we're already doing this. So you all have GPS, and actually each of these GPS satellites that beams the signal to your phone, basically saying, hey, here I am. Each of these GPS satellites already uses an atomic clock orbiting in space around us to keep track of where each of us are on the face of the Earth. And then, yes, we can extend this to space travel. Also, kind of space probes that we send out to, let's say, other planets, maybe the edge of our solar system. They already all keep track of time by using atomic clocks. And this is an innovation that's, yeah, basically from the field of atomic or molecular physics. And you read the article, right? There was this article about the new molecules found on Saturn. Yes. Uh huh. So that's actually another. That's actually another way of studying the universe while staying here on Earth. Look at planets. We have an amazing telescopes. Some of them are in space, and some of them are located here on Earth. But you can look at planets, and okay, then you can snap a picture. But how then do you know that the certain molecules present? There? And every now and then in the, in the news, you will see a new article of people saying, "Oh, we found this molecule. It's over there, and it might." point us to life. So indeed, one of the most recent ones is uh, phosphine on Venus or uh, carbon-3, hydrogen-2 on Titan, which is one of the moons of Saturn. And then the exciting thing every time is that maybe these molecules are made by some sort of life, life form, like we here on Earth exhale CO2 all the time. So how do they do it? Well, basically, they look at the atmosphere of such a planet and they place a prism which separates the light. And then if you look at the light and especially at what, which colors are present and which are missing, you can actually infer which molecules are present there. And this is something you can do here on Earth as well. A rigorous way to go about this is to do experiments like we do, where you have some molecules traveling through vacuum and you, you basically research them with a laser. So you give them one color at once and you see if the molecule absorbs it or not. And then you move on to the next color and you do this basically for a full range. And then in the end, you have what's called a spectrum. And for each molecule, you can basically see its fingerprint, basically which colors it likes, which ones it doesn't like. And then you can compare this to observations of other planets. And you can say, hey, this fingerprint matches. So apparently this molecule is present there. And that's actually the way they do it. So there are experiments in labs much like mine. And actually in Nijmegen, they have a huge lab to do this. It's called the Felix Laboratory. Uh, and here they are constantly putting in a new sample of molecules, measuring the spectrum. And they, well, sometimes they directly uh, collaborate with astrophysicists to basically explain one of the features they are seeing on some distant planet or distant star or sometimes even around the meteorite. As soon as meteorites enter our solar system, they heat up because of the sun and they will emit or they will evaporate tiny bits of, of gas, of water. And also in these meteorites, they can look at which, which particles are present there. And one of the really surprising things people found over the past years is that sometimes, or actually surprisingly often, these molecules or these, these comets they contain molecules that are thought to be essential for life, like DNA or proteins. Yeah, one of the theories that is out there now is that actually life got introduced by meteorites crashing into Earth, bringing these molecules to us. Mm. It's very interesting because where did these come from? Is there some other life form out there that, that got destroyed and these bits of their DNA are hurling towards us starting life here? Or yeah, nobody knows, right? But it seems that the molecules that we deem essential for our existence, they are present in space and actually they fly about and they're not that unique. Let's let's speculate a little bit uh, because what will be the effect of an increased accessibility to space of your field of research? What experiments could we devise that benefit from being out in space? You're asking me to predict the future, right? <laughs> yes, please. Um, there's one more way that you can use molecules to study the most advanced models of our, our, our universe right now. And that is by, you briefly mentioned it, by precision uh, measurement. And the atomic clocks is one example, really precise time measurement. But there are other things that you can measure really precisely. And again, molecules are the, are the best way to do that. And so there are all sorts of, let's say, parameters that go into our best theoretical models, let's say general relativity or the standard model theories for gravity and for the smallest particles that our, our world is made up of. So one way to study these is to go to the extremes and measure them in a collider like uh, at CERN, but you need a very large machine to do that. And another thing you might hope to do is to see basically signatures of these models in the molecules that are all around us. That is what precision measurements try to do. So you have, for example, an ammonia molecule and they try to measure one of its properties and they try to measure it over the course of, let's say, 10 years. And if it stays the same, that means also 
basically that the model that we used stays constant. And if it's changing, well, apparently there's some time dependence in the model and you have to include that. That's actually one of the one of the big questions of the of the standard model. If all of these parameters that are in there, if they are constant or not. And then to go back to you and if you could have an experiment down here on Earth, which is already pretty expensive, but let's say in the future space travel is much more cheap and you can send the same experiment to space and you can repeat them, then you can see if they give the same same result or not. But one important one very important thing that is different is that we are here constantly in the gravitational field of the Earth. And we cannot really escape that. And sort of one of the underlying assumptions of general relativity is that a correspondence between being in a gravitational field, but freely falling in that. So let's say you jump off a building, uh, forget about the impact for a little bit, and <laughs> say you're cruising through the air, it should feel exactly the same as if you're hovering out in space. Maybe sort of intuitively that makes sense, but Einstein was actually the first to realize this, that if you fall, you are weightless. And if you are in space, you are weightless too. But yeah, it's very different because we were very close to the Earth and there was this gravity pulling us towards the Earth very fast. Whereas in space, you're just at a standstill, not being accelerated, and still you feel the same, namely weightless. And Einstein was the first to realize this and, to, and he says that there should be no difference in experiments or in physics or between falling in a gravitational field and being suspended out in space with no gravitational fields there. Mm -hmm. And this is sort of an assumption that we could test clearly for, let's say, everyday objects like a rocket. This is the case, for, as far as we can tell, a rocket falling down to Earth behaves the same as a rocket uh, being suspended in space, uh, namely it's weightless. But if you could do a really precise measurement, then maybe you could start to pick up on differences. And this then would hint towards, uh, let's say, departure from the theories of Einstein. Um, maybe something a skeptic would say is, if they have held up for 100 years, well, apparently they are very good. Why are you looking to? Why are you looking for deviations from a theory that is so perfect? Yeah, why? Yeah, and the reason is actually <laughs> that right now there are two meta uh, theories that I already mentioned before: general relativity and the standard model. And general relativity then describes basically the large objects in our universe and gravity. And then if you zoom in towards the smaller scale, you will have quantum mechanics uh, and eventually the standard model that describe the very tiniest things and how they interact. Uh, and at the moment, these two are not really, we cannot really make them meet. So there are two theories talking about different regimes, namely the very big and the very small, but we know there is an in-between, right? I mean, we are living there. Yeah, there's not really an obvious way to, to combine these two models. And you're and saying again, that then, with testing and with experimenting or, or constructing these experiments in space, we could make them meet. Well, it's sort of an underlying assumption of all our, these physicists that there should be one theory describing all of this, right? Because one theory is more elegant, so why wouldn't there be? And we have no idea how to do this currently, but trying to do measurements and seeing where this, this uh, each of these two theories breaks down, like the experiment I just described, yeah, that would be a hint for theoreticians to start looking and to focus their imagination towards, come up with a way to indeed combine these theories in the end. Mm -hmm. But all of that is based on the assumption that they should meet. So nowadays there's this guy, uh, Wolfgang, uh, and he has started what's called the Wolfram Physics Project. His main main premise is that the universe is kind of an algorithm that constantly runs. And that is then also why we perceive time is because this algorithm is running all the time. And he was a physicist. Yeah. And then he basically completely focused on this computational stuff. And now he's coming back to the physics saying physics should be computational. Uh, you know what I'm wondering about? It, because everything nowadays seems to be an algorithm. Yeah. And I want to know then, as a philosopher maybe, what is the definition of, of an algorithm? So an algorithm would be some recipe step-by-step mm. guide to doing something. Yeah. And yeah, why would that something not be? live out the universe but yeah, okay uh, <laughs> but then it's just a buzzword you know what i mean you know what i'm yeah, yeah i know what you mean well in a sense we as physicists have, have claimed for a very long time that the universe is sort of computational right because we are constantly in search for formulas that can predict the future basically we want to say i have a model now and i can input whatever i want and then it will give me a result so basically i'm predicting the future with these formulas 
I can say if I throw a ball, it will land exactly there because that's what the formulas tell me. So physicists have already claimed for a lot of years that the universe is computational. It operates by certain rules. So actually the step towards saying it has to be an algorithm is not so large. Yeah, because this computationability is actually already in there. And actually the, the fact that the universe could be an algorithm is sort of a weaker statement than saying that it needs to be computational. Because as I just said, if you have a formula, you can predict the future. But in the theory of this Wolfram guy, he says, well, yes, the universe is an algorithm, but the only way to know where it goes is to let the algorithm run. So there is not necessarily a computation ability, but there is a, let's say, a determinism, some structured way to go forward in time. Mm. But there is not necessarily a way for us to know where, end up, where it will end up. In that sense, this is actually why I started this, why this topic came to mind. He said, says that both of these theories of uh, general relativity and particle physics, they are sort of subdomains in which it is possible to find formulas. But in between, you just have to follow the algorithm and basically uh, and then follow the... the flow of time and ah. see where it leads. You know, so he will say they shouldn't meet because, and he calls this computational irreducibility. So there is no way to look at it and formulate a theory yeah, that will give you, let's say, answers about what the future will look like. So the only way to 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 know how the future is going to be is to live it out <laughs> try to stay alive <laughs> this nice that in this framework at least there is the option of these two theories not meeting mm. i know that some physicists are like oh, this guy is crazy oh. there's this fine line between being a genius and being crazy right so let's also in retrospect <laughs> in, indeed indeed with this question i think or with this uh, speculative part we've come to an uh, to an end of this interview However, I want to know which books are you currently reading or podcast series that you could recommend to us? Yeah, I don't really listen to lots of podcasts, but mm -hmm. I do watch a lot of YouTube and some of the channels that I like to follow. One of them is Kurzgesagt, or in English, in a nutshell. And they sort of take these wild topics and explain them in a really easy way. And also they want to they visualize everything. Right? So they make really nice animation and they have a video on quantum computers but also on black holes and everything that you can think of. And they, they, they're animating it in a really lively way. Also, their videos on ants are highly, uh, I would highly recommend. And the other channel I, I like to watch a lot is uh, Very Tessian. And this is also a guy explaining physics, asking weird questions. Yeah, they are really cool. We will share the link on our website. And then about your research, you are pretty anonymous on the internet. <laughs> I haven't made a name for myself yet, unfortunately. <laughs> Where can we find your, your research or read more about your research? Yeah, if you want to stay up to date of, of whatever we are publishing, then the best way would be to just go to the page of our group, which would be Spectroscopy of Cold Molecules at University. Mm -hmm. And that will be a list of publications. And also, as long as I work, there will be a picture of me there. Yeah, other than that, I don't really have a page where I keep track of this sort of stuff. No, it's fine. It's something to work on. <laughs> <laughs> we will share the links in the, on our website. Thank you so much, Dag, for this interview. And, um, and I wish you all the, the best with your research. Yeah, thank you. Thank I wish you. you all the best as well with this podcast series and placing your finger on this wall of imagination. In the next podcast, we will go into conversation with Professor Vincent Icke. Vincent is a professor of theoretical astronomy at Leiden University and professor of cosmology at the University of Amsterdam, the Netherlands. He studied theoretical physics and astronomy and obtained his PhD with the thesis Formation of Galaxies Inside Clusters. What role does he consider the imagination to play in his work field? For more information, links and show notes about this podcast, visit scientificimagination.org.